Hi, Phil Hassan here from nowspinning.co.uk. I've been asked a couple of times um, why I haven't covered um, Led Zeppelin. And, uh, and was it because I didn't like them? I'm a huge Zeppelin fan. And like many people from my generation, do you kind of do a th the holy trinity of British rock was Deep Purple, Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin. And the order that I've just said that has just made me realise that's the order in which I, I guess I would choose them. But I cannot deny that everything came from Led Zeppelin in a way. When I got into Led Zeppelin, um, I, was, I was at school, I was into Slade, Sweet, a um, bit of T-Rex, and a friend of mine said, you really need to listen to progressive rock. Now, progressive rock in the 70s didn't necessarily mean just Yes or Genesis or King Crimson, etc. It meant anything but that was album orientated. So Roy Gallagher would be classed as progressive rock in the 70s and obviously Led Zeppelin because they didn't release uh, any singles in the UK. So when a friend of mine said, you want to start with Led Zeppelin 2 and Led Zeppelin 4, those are the best ones. Um, so give, give those a spin first. And of course, they had Whole Lot of Love, Black Dog, Stay Out of Heaven, um, Rock and Roll, Heartbreaker, etc. And um, Led Zeppelin 3 was seen as the acoustic one. And then in 1975, when I was finishing my exams at school, Physical Graffiti became the soundtrack of that summer for me. Um, and I know that that is seen as the pinnacle of the greatest rock album of all time. So what is my favourite Led Zeppelin album? I look, I like all of those. Um, but the one that I play the most is this one, the debut from early 1969. And I think that the reason why this one has stuck out, because at the time when I, was a, when I was a kid, people said, oh, you want to buy the first one because it's got um, communication breakdown on it. And yeah, I like that. It's a couple and two and a half minutes of um, riffage. Um, but it was mainly uh, how many more times that was the track that I played the most, really. But it isn't just the music here. It's... Jimmy Page's production, and this is a this was released at a time when stereo was a brand new shiny toy. I mean, nowadays, probably because of the way that a lot of people are playing things through a single sonar speaker, or they they've got their earphones in, or they're playing it through a you know a Bluetooth speaker. Stereo isn't quite as dramatic or as exciting. In, in fact. Any kind of sound excitement now is it seems to be handed over to to your 5.1 or 13.1 Dolby Atmos movie on your Blu-ray player. But back in the 70s, stereo was really exciting. Um, maybe too exciting sometimes. Um, what I mean is that you've got like everything's at two o'clock or um, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, if you look at a clock face, so things are kind of spread in this tiny area, whereas in the 70s, it was doled all the way back to about five and seven. So guitars could be zooming from one side of your headphones to the other with all sorts of other effects going on. And I think that's what makes this album so exciting in 2021 because you realise that Jimmy Page's vision, because he obviously heard this in his head, he was, the studio was just as important as his guitar playing to me. The way he produced this, and he was completely in control. Robert Plant at this time was just pleased to be in a band. It, you know, um, he wasn't the rock god yet. But again, the way he uses his voice you know, and, um, you know, especially on the, the how many more times and those, those little tracks of the hunter in amongst it all. And, the, and the, the vocals are kept back in the distance and there's guitars, bits of wah wah and everything just drifting around in the kind of soundscape. To this day, I still feel when I put this album on, I can, I, when I first heard it, I knew it was special, 
But to try and imagine what it must have been like in 1969, when everything you knew up to that point was kind of pop or psychedelic pop or whatever, and then this arrived, it changed the world. And it opened the door for, you know, literally not only a few months later for, you know, Sabbath and Purple and all the other bands. And But this was sitting at the beginning, you know, right coming in at the blues rock boom in the UK. And yes, they were influenced or inspired or borrowed various bits and pieces over the years. This has become apparent. But then there was no one else doing it. Um, and the, it's not just the rock stuff. It's like, um, babe, I'm going to leave you. I mean, that is a fantastic song. It's a bit, it's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? He changes his mind. Um, he's going to leave her. And then towards the end of the song, he's never going to leave her. But I think that's beside the point. It's, um, it is a stunning track. And I think th there are some bands that each person has to be in it. You can see why they stopped when John Bonham died. Because each member created the sound of Led Zeppelin. You know, no other voice could have made these songs sound like they do and as unique as Robert Plant. And John Bonham's drumming, and John Paul Jones's bass playing, and of course, the orchestra, the conductor, Jimmy Page, his template created the, the Led Zeppelin myth that made them already the top of a giant mountain where you couldn't quite get to them. This mystique that Led Zeppelin maintained, whereas lots of other bands, maybe Purple, as you know, I'm a huge Purple fan, but I'll have to admit that the way that their back catalogue was handled, the mystique evaporated fairly quickly on with all those compilations. But the control that Peter Grant had over Zeppelin meant that this kind of aura of, you know, almost at the centre spread of Zeppelin for this kind of Tolkien-esque mystery behind the band is still there to this day. I didn't go for the Super Deluxe Edition box um, when I upgraded to this on CD. I had the first CD from the 90s and then I went with the the more recent two disc remasters with the live album on this which is okay you know the sound quality is not brilliant but I was hoping for more to be honest um, you know the I guess the booklet is bigger in the big box, it was nearly a hundred pounds, but um, you know, this will do for me. But I think this is pop, this is the best sounding version. But I think what was there already m makes this um, an album that everyone should hear. Now, even if you think you're not a Led Zeppelin fan or you know, you're not someone who collects stuff, this is an important document it made, it changed everything. And it sounds like nothing else, even though a lot of the tracks are like 12 bar blues and youth blues standards. And Jeff Beck, of course, with um, with Truth was doing something very similar and Jimmy Page in a way stole his thunder with this. But this is um, a, a, an absolute classic album. And I bet on YouTube, there's probably thousands of videos of that mentioned Led Zeppelin one, which is another reason why I hesitated. Um, but this to me is, the, is, the, is the, the thing, the pivotal point, the crucible of rock and roll, really. Um, so that's Led Zeppelin one, 1969, many lifetimes ago. Even I was too young to go out and buy it when it came out. But you can tell the greatness you can tell the atmosphere, the stereo, the songs, the variety of the songs, which is missing from a lot of modern rock, really. But that's Led Zeppelin 1. Check it out and make sure when you look through your collection, you have it somewhere. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for all my patrons and supporters. I appreciate um, your help very much. Please subscribe, share if you think someone else would be into the into the stuff that's in my head. And I'll see you on the next one. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.